Good morning, everyone. Uh, start out with the announcements. Uh, we have our Christmas program, Sunday, December 12th at 6 o'clock p.m. Scripture, music, fellowship, and refreshments. Uh, please bring a snack or treat to share. We also have the Ladies' Fellowship on December 19th at 2 p.m. here at the church. Uh, we also need help cleaning the church every week, and there is a sign-up table, uh, sign-up sheet on the back table uh, in the lobby, I think, uh, so please feel free to sign up there if you're able. Uh, we also need help with the yard work around the church. Uh, if you'd like to volunteer to help out with that, please see, um, I guess today, please see Rory. And uh, I will be reading uh, today's call to worship, which is Psalm 90, verses 13 to 17. Return, O Lord, how long, and have compassion on your servants. O satisfy us early with your mercy, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad according to the days in which you have afflicted us, the years in which we have seen evil. Let your work appear to your servants and your glory to their children. Let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. And I'll pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this Lord's Day that we can come together uh, as your children and as brothers and sisters to worship you. Father, we pray that you would clear our hearts of all of our worries and cares, uh, that you would help us uh, to seek first your kingdom, uh, and let us trust uh, that you will add all these other things to us, Lord. Uh, I pray uh, that if there are any unconfessed sin uh, in our lives that are hindering our worship and communion with you. Today you would remove those and purify us. Let us focus uh, completely on your goodness, your grace, your mercy, and your peace. And most of all, please let us focus on the gift of Christ, Christ's death and resurrection, the price that he paid for us, for our sin, that we might come here today as your adopted children to glorify you for this wonderful work that you've done in our lives. Let us focus on that today. As we come together, let us worship you, praise you, and thank you for all of your goodness and all of your great works. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Church's One Foundation, hymn number 186. Oh, 
Someday to my home far away. 
We've heard from him before and enjoyed his messages. Please come and teach us today. It's my uh, mixed drink. Finest uh, great value of drinking water and with a shot of Gatorade. It's the only way I can drink water, I'm sorry. I uh, don't mean to disparage our, our Lord's great creation of water, but I like to enhance it a little bit sometimes, so. Well, Gene said I need no introduction, but how many of you we've never met before? A few, uh, that's what I thought. You know what? I'm always uh, in need of new friends, so you're it. Just to bring you up to date, this is not my first rodeo here at Berean. Uh, 
I first stepped foot in this building in 1970, shortly after uh, Joanne and Wesley Clem arrived, about three years after they launched the work here. And in uh, 1971, my wife and I returned <clears throat> to Utah from upstate New York. We, we arrived with a uh, six-month-old baby and a cat named Dingoing. Now, I, I like cats, but that cat earned his name. So uh, well, we arrived and uh, engaged uh, for about a year and a half in a team ministry with the Clems. Then the Lord uh, gave us an opportunity to uh, be part of a ministry in Tooele, uh, west of here. Most of you know where that is. So uh, it's, it's been a while uh, since we first set foot in this building, but uh, the memories are still strong, and I know things that went on in this building you would never dream of. Good things. Great things. So it's good to get back. I I'm sorry it's under the conditions of... Um, uh, a pastor, Wayne, if you're watching, hello, uh, not able to be here today. Well, hi there. I guess old friends right here, right? And uh, we're, we're going to be turning, by the way, in, in our Bibles to uh, Isaiah chapter 6. So you can get moving on over there. I suppose every, every Christian preacher, pastor, evangelist, missionary, has an Isaiah 6 sermon. This one's mine, although I hope it's not too unique because if it's too unique, I'm getting away from the text. So I hope it sounds a whole lot like uh, what you've heard from others as well. Um, every time I look in the mirror, I'm reminded of, of uh, the need of the title that I, I give my passage, and it's called uh, How to Be Better Looking. Uh, th these days, I would just assume mirrors would go away altogether. I don't recognize the old guy I see uh, looking back at me anymore. I have become my grandfather with a vengeance, taking more pills than he ever dreamed of, costing a lot more than his did. But Isaiah chapter 6 talks about how to be better looking. Now, it's not that I think you need to be better looking than I'm seeing right now. My, what a good-looking group. But you knew that before I ever got here. Uh, I, I know that we, um, we care about our appearance. Uh, there are limits to which I will go to try to enhance my appearance. For a while, I tried to comb my hair all the way over the top. There was a point at which my teenage daughter said, Dad, just give it up. So I did. Uh, there was a time when I tried to color what was left of it. That was kind of stupid, but I tried to do that for a while. Uh, so we, we try to work with what we've got or maybe try to enhance what we don't have, wish we had. Now, Christians come in all shapes and sizes. My size kind of keeps changing. Uh, yet probably all of us would, would, would like to make some improvements if we could, along the way. Uh, Isaiah was an outstanding Old Testament saint, and I know for a fact that he was very good looking. Not that I know him personally, I'm not that old. But I, I, I know that he was very good looking. He was a resident of uh, Jerusalem, and uh, his ministry, his renowned ministry, we, we, everybody knows about Isaiah a little bit at least, uh, was mostly concentrated in his own hometown and his native land of, of Judah. And while we have no drawings, no statutes, statues, I should say, no, no engravings or any meaningful descriptions of his physical appearance, yet we do know how he looked. What do you mean, Lloyd Larkin? What do you mean? Well, you'll find out here in just a moment. Because I think with the aid of the Holy Spirit, Applying the scriptures, we are about to examine not only how he looked, but how we can look like Isaiah. So let's have a word of prayer, and we will embark upon our little journey together today. Our Father, we don't mean to trivialize the words of scripture with, with kind of silly words, 
So, Lord, help us to uh, see past anything that I would have contrived and to, uh, to get to the meat, the kernel of truth, the reality of what you have revealed in this passage, because we know that we are born again by your word, which lives and abides forever. It's by your word that we grow and have our nourishment. And Lord, it's by your word that we know you and your will and your way. So we pray that this would be a, a time of being exposed to your word, submitting ourselves to it, implementing it, uh, and living it out for the sake of your glory mostly, but also for the sake of our own welfare and those around about us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. Well, I think first of all, we can become better looking by looking upward. I think that's what we need to do as we start. Uh, the first two verses <clears throat> tell us what Isaiah saw. He actually saw the Lord, and that's, that's who we see when we look upward. He saw the Lord as the high one. Verses 1 and 2. In the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah writes, I, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it, above this throne, uh, stood seraphims. This is you know, an order of angel, actually, we're talking about here. Stood seraphims, uh, and above it, the, the, the spirits of seraphim, e each one had six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. Now, th that's kind of a weird creature. That's more weird than my cat Dingling, but a lot more exalted. The, the, this angel with six wings. You don't have one of those on your Christmas tree. Well, maybe you do. I don't know. Maybe you have a particularly godly biblical Christmas tree. But a six-winged angel here. Now, there, there should be, there really must be a time in each life when this upward look takes place. I wonder if that's happened in your life. Now, Isaiah had been in the ministry for years before this upward look took place. There is some question as to whether this event marks his commission to service, or call to ministry, or his conversion. The, uh, the discussion goes on with that. Now, many are the testimonies, by the way, of apparently effective servants of God who later uh, confessed that they were not even saved, though they had been in the ministry for years. Imagine that. John Wesley is an example, for instance. He was converted while ministering to Indians in the state of Georgia. Well, that must have surprised a few people, but better than than never, right? Amen. Uh, D.L. Moody, of all people, the famous American evangelist, uh, was preaching before he was saved. That was according to his own testimony. I personally believe, and you don't have to agree with me on this, I think Isaiah chapter 6 probably marks the conversion of Isaiah. That's just my, I, I think it probably does. Uh, it sounds like the conversion, for instance, of the Apostle Paul in some ways, doesn't it? I think it does. Uh, Paul fell on his face. Uh, before the exalted Lord in full repentance and faith and immediately out of his lips. And this did not come after you know, going to summer camp for three years and being at the bonfire on Friday night and all of the emotion and singing of the songs and where, where he said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Immediately in his heart was what I think is immediately in the heart of all true conversions 
Lord, what do you want me to do? Because after all, if we are being saved, we are receiving not Jesus, not Christ, but the Lord Jesus Christ. How can you be saved with two-thirds of a Savior? He is the Lord. So I, I think when Isaiah finally saw who he was really dealing with. When he looked up, he saw the Lord high and lifted up. And he saw himself low and stooped down before this holy God. So he looks at this most high God, very much in contrast to what was going on around about him, by the way. We sometimes just read over uh, words like they're fillers. The Bible is so contextualized historically. It is not some kind of fantasy. It is set in real, verifiable history. For instance, he said, in the year King Uzziah died. Ah, now we know when this is taking place. A real historical event. The king, Uzziah. Well, it's kind of a, a big deal when the leader of a nation dies. That's a big deal. Big, big changes are in store when that happens. Some of us, um, most of us who are older, all of us who are older, have lived through change of um, presidency in, in, in this nation through death. It's, it's kind of a hard thing to deal with. Assassinations and things like that. King Uzziah had been isolated for some time with leprosy before he died. So the king of the, of the nation was not really very high or lifted up. As a matter of fact, he was very much dead at this point. But our king, our king of kings, is so high that he'll never die. Never die. He will live forever. Hebrews 7.25, therefore... He is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. That's who we see when we look up. One who is that high and that was there. You know, we all have this nasty habit of getting old and dying ever since the fall of Adam. We definitely need help. Last three years have been a lot, a lot different in my life than I had been planning. Physical things have been kind of catching up with me. But you know what? Some things never change. My God does not change. I'm finding out that his strength is sufficient for my need. He's high and he's lifted up. You know, I need you every hour. I, I, nah, I gotta, gotta, Adjust the words. Uh, man, I need him every minute at this point. Every second. You got it, Lord. Thank you. You too? Okay. By the way, thanks for the music. Appreciate that. Good to see you again. Uh, our king of kings is so high that he's going to reign forever. Now, some politicians, you're kind of glad to see him come and go, you know? <laughs> But our King of Kings is wonderful. He will never go anywhere. He's going to reign forever. Psalm 146 and verse 10, just one verse to remind us of that. The Lord shall reign forever. Your God, O Zion, to all generations. And then the psalmist just breaks forth. He, all, he explodes with Praise the Lord. And he reigns. Hey, folks, it's not out of control out there. Our God reigns. He reigns forever. So exactly who is this high one? Well, we know he's the Lord. It's kind of interesting. This coordinates. This connects really nicely with John chapter 12, verses 37 through 41, 
where he is identified as none other than the Lord Jesus Christ himself, uh, Isaiah was pleased to get a pre-incarnate look at the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a very special thing. Our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, is high. We dare not trivialize him at all, ever. He sits on a high throne which cannot be overthrown. People these days don't give Jesus Christ a whole lot of thought, but they will. They will. He sits on the throne of glory before which we worship. And before all will worship at one time. He sits on the throne of authority before which we submit and all one day will submit. He sits on a throne that is high because of its infinite grace. The throne of grace. When you have one who has all power and who has all authority and who is perfectly holy, you want him also to be full of grace. And he is. Aren't you glad when you look up, you see one like that? His train filled the ancient temple. As that, as that took place, may, may today the parallel be that his presence would displace all competing objects of devotion. If we claim to be disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are saying that, that we are following him. I trust that's consistently true. I fall short. I'm ashamed because he deserves better than that. But let's renew our devotion to him as we see him high and lifted up. Now hovering above the throne were, th were these, you can call seraphims, I've seen the S on the end and sometimes not. Seraphim, y y you see, the, the, these creatures. The name for these angelic creatures means burning. I'm not really quite sure all that means, but I do know that we need to burn with zeal for our Savior. And I think the closer we get to the throne, the more we will burn with love and devotion and passion for him. Now, what would we have and what would we do if God gave us six wings well I trust that if we had six wings such as these seraphim would to God that we would would two of them cover our face in fear the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom so don't, don't shy away from that, that expression. Can't get cavalier about God. I trust that with two of our wings, we might cover our feet for their waywardness. And with the two remaining wings, let's fly to fields of service, furthering the gospel cause. There are a lot of things that we need to do in life. I understand there are responsibilities. We can't drop the responsibilities that our sovereign God has laid upon us. But wherever we go, May it be with the gospel of Christ foremost in our thinking to further him 
and his cause. God grant us a glimpse of this high one as we look up. Now, Isaiah looks up. He sees this high one, but as you know, this high one is very holy. Verse 3, one of the seraphim cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. You know, there's a big difference between a clear day in northern Utah and one that has yuck and muck all over. You can't even see the mountains, right? Don't even want to breathe that stuff, but unfortunately, you don't go too far if you don't breathe something. And I'll tell you what, there's a difference between seeing God in his full holiness and somehow missing that. It, it, blur our vision and can really be detrimental to our health spiritually and maybe other ways as well. While affirming that the high one was the Lord of hosts, they, they proclaim his holiness in, in a threefold way. Holy, holy, holy. Some see this as an affirmation in the Old Testament of the Trinitarian God of the Bible. He's perfectly holy. He is infinitely holy. He is eternally holy. The Holy Father, the Holy Son, the Holy Spirit. Isaiah even saw the whole earth being filled with his glory. So what happens? What does God want us to take away from this? What is the takeaway, one of them at least, from getting a look at the high God in his holiness? Well, several times in the Bible, something like this appears. Uh, the one I'm going to read is from 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 16. The scripture says, in response to God's holiness, Be holy, God says. You be holy, for I am holy. That's the standard. Nothing less than that is ever accepted. Less than that is forgiven, thank God, but never accepted. God created us to be holy, and holiness is not a relative word. It's absolute. That's why when the Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, it's a serious thing. Because even falling short by a millimeter is enough to get us condemned. He demands and will accept only full and complete holiness. That's why when Isaiah saw how holy God was, he said, I can't do this. I'm undone. In my own strength, it's totally hopeless. I've proven that so many times. Maybe you have too. Yes, you have. Well, he's the high one. He's the holy one. Verse number four tells us something else about this one we see when we have this upward look. And the posts of the door of the temple were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. This to me is kind of a, well, an awesome situation being described here. So he is the hallowed one. Jesus taught us to always recognize that whenever we would look heavenward. Hallowed. Be your name. When the holiness of God is proclaimed, when the holiness of God becomes evident to us, when we recognize that we are in the presence of the thrice holy God, 
may we be shaken. May we be moved. May we be affected. Are we moved today before his majesty? What has happened to reverence for God? You know, the Amorites and the Canaanites had heard about these Hebrew people coming through their land. Heard about people who were there to take possession. And they recognized that God was powerful and that they were in for some changes. Uh, Joshua chapter 5 and verse 1 verifies that these, these people, the original uh, residents there, heard of the power of Jehovah and it said their hearts melted within them. Do we need a little melting to go on? You know how you get rid of imperfections in, in metal? You heat it up. So maybe we need to have some, some melting take place to get rid of some impurities along the way. It'll make us all better looking as we look up and let God have his effect in our lives. All right, now, I'm going to hurry along here. I'll cut down my usual three-hour sermon to something a little less than that today. So today I won't be preaching very long, though it may seem that way. We can be better looking not only by looking upward, but by looking inward. Verses 5 through 7. Now when we look upward, we see the Lord. When we look inward, and we've already kind of tipped our hand a bit on this one, we're going to see our lack. Serious areas of lacking. I could even use another L word. I, I love to do a little alliteration when I prepare sermons. Some people hate that. If you hate it, hang in there. I'll be done pretty soon. We could even say, when we look inward, we see our loathfulness. We may not like what we see at all. We may end up hating ourselves for what we have done and for how far short we have fallen. Isaiah saw it as a hopeless situation. Verse number five. So I said, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. He is evidencing the unmistakable response of a convicted sinner, one who has seen the King and the Lord of hosts. He had been recognized and presented himself as a, a, a prophet. Okay, so a prophet is a person who goes around saying things in the name of God. We think of them a lot as giving futuristic predictions. Occasionally a prophet would do that, but more likely than not, in the average day, a prophet would simply be proclaiming the word of God to people who needed something for that particular day to live by, by in, in, in their lives, to profit them in that way. So he's recognized as a prophet of God and he's immediately struck with the realization that this man whose lips had been framing words about God, that, that he had been guilty of sinning against God with his lips. And I don't know all that that means. But I do know that our mouths always betray us eventually. Sooner or later. 
Sins of the tongue, aren't they interesting to think about? Not always pleasant. Boy, I tell you, we have lips and tongues capable of beauty and creativity, but also capable of lying. Then there are some of us who just plain talk too much. I went to a one-room schoolhouse in upstate New York. I remember to this day, I probably was in the third grade. My teacher wondering if I would ever quit talking. There's impulsive talking. Boy, that can get us into trouble. Just, you hear something, bang, something in return. There, there's the kind of talking that has a very biting kind of effect. We hurt people. Not necessarily by the words we choose, but the way we save them. Piercing. There's outright cursing. Gossiping. Of course, when we do it, it's not gossiping. We're just kind of passing on information that might be helpful for somebody else to know. There's proud and flaunting type of speech. Sometimes we flatter people for the advantage that can be for us. Sometimes we are inappropriately silent when we should speak up and we don't. Oh, so we can maybe relate to Isaiah here. When he got an idea of how holy, holy is, it went straight to his lips as far as he was concerned. Of all the things that, that he could have looked at as being a problem for him, the Lord convicted him of his speech. You know, Solomon wrote it in Proverbs 18 and verse 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Jesus took it to another level, didn't he? By making it clear that the tongue is actually an expression of who and what we are in our hearts. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 34, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. That's the real source of the betrayal. Our mouth and our tongues will betray who and what's really going on. Thankfully, there are plenty of people out there who love the Lord, and you can just tell by the way they speak, I want to be around this person. There's sweetness, and there's goodness, and there's profit. So Isaiah had a problem. His inward look revealed that he was guilty of sinning with his tongue, and he had no innate ability to fix it. So, the next point is obvious. We're helpless when we do this inward look. Verse number six. <clears throat> then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. If anything was to be done to remedy Isaiah's hopeless condition and his helpless condition, it was God who would have to transform his life by some means not of Isaiah's own doing. You know, the, the Bible makes it clear in Romans chapter 8 and verse number 8, so then those that are in the flesh cannot please God. If this is an account of Isaiah's conversion going on here, if he's saying, man, I, I, I am undone before God. I, I, I don't even have a, re, a proper relationship with him that it was important for him to know at that point, it's important for us to know today, that if we realize that we do not have a relationship with God, the only thing we can contribute to that is our own unworthiness. 
The, the, I am convinced that we don't even have the faith with which to believe in God unless he gives that to us. That we cannot, we cannot work up repentance, which is essential to salvation, without the sovereign, individually bestowed work of God in our hearts. But God delights in helping the helpless. Yeah. So the seraph here flies to, Sarah, to Isaiah's rescue with a live call from the altar, making a personal application of God's provision. Yeah, I don't like that. God will fly to our rescue. And then verse number seven, God gives relief from our heaviness. Boy, this is heavy stuff, this part of the sermon. I know. This is not the fun stuff. This, this inward look is not a time to giggle. He touched my mouth with it, with this live coal, and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin purged. Amen! As undone as he was, now he was redone. God meets his need. Only God can meet our needs. Isaiah bore a heavy load of iniquity and sin. But the heavy load is taken away and the sin is purged by the application of God's gracious, gracious provision. I want to link this up with Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 14. The blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, shall cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. That's your hope today. If you, if you are thinking, I, I don't think I have a good relationship with God. I, I don't know what you're talking about. For instance, I don't know where I'm going to spend eternity. And the whole idea of eternity scares me. What you need is a good dose of the blood of Christ applied to the iniquity and the sin that we all bear. And the only solution is God's provision in Christ. So now Isaiah was free to speak to God and for God. Finally, we need this look upward, the look inward, but we also need to look outward. We need that. Verse 8, we see that there is a call that we need to heed. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, here am I, send me. Are we listening for God's call in our lives? I'm not talking about audible voices. I'm talking about being open to wherever God would send us. Whatever he has for us to do. Could the Holy Spirit be personalizing this verse to us today? And are we willing to say, here am I, send me? Without qualification. Anywhere but. That's a good way to get a ticket to that place, by the way. You know, it is a lofty honor to represent the King of Kings, wherever he sends. If my wife and I had a chance to do it over again, we'd come to Utah again in a heartbeat. Some people feel like coming to Utah must be a life sentence. We love it here. Doesn't look like home. Haven't had a family Christmas in 50 years with my family back in New York. You see them at other times. Just so happens it didn't work out to get back there for Christmas. Where's home anyway? You know, I haven't gotten home yet. Still, still waiting to go home. Wherever God sends us is the place to be. Here am I, send me. 
there is this call to heed. There's a command to be heralds. Verse number nine. He said, go and tell this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, do not perceive. Boy, that's a little strange. Though Isaiah's audience would not respond favorably, yet his ministry would be just as blessed of God as long as he remained faithful to the specific commands to go and to tell them what God wanted him to say when he got there. You probably heard this passage from Ezekiel 3. Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore, hear a word from my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, you will surely die, and you give him no warning, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life. That same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. Yet if you warn the wicked, and he does not turn from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. There is a, um, something we must heed here. And there is a command to be heralds, whether they listen or whether they don't listen. Finally, there is a, a world in need of great compassion as we look outward. Boy, our world's in a mess. And you know what? It's probably going to get worse. It's, uh, it's not a pleasant thing to wonder if you've done all you could do. When you get word that the neighbor across the street died, you say, oh, I wish I had said this or said that. The world's in great need, hurting. Families fractured. There's so much hurt. Well, when Isaiah became aware that God was still calling him to continue service now as a truly spiritually prepared person to do it, then I said, Lord, how long? How long do I need to do this? <coughs> how long should I... Talk to people who don't seem to listen to anything I have to say. Lord, how long? And he answered, until the cities are laid waste and without an inhabitant, the houses are without a man, and the land is utterly desolate. That's how long. Now, get along, Isaiah, and do your job. Is our love for the Lord and for souls so genuine that we would energetically and enthusiastically evangelize, even if we knew in advance that it would be rejected and result in increasing hardness. As we look out, I trust our, our love would be like our saviors who looked over the city of Jerusalem and he wept. And he knew they were going to kill him. You know that. We leave the results to God. Sometimes God places us in a tough place to serve. I get it. There was an old Bible teacher years ago that put it this way in one of his commentaries. He said, it takes special faith and obedience to continue to preach to an unheeding people who are only hardened by the word instead of being softened by it. The Lord's answer to Isaiah was that the message must be proclaimed until there was no one left to hear. So don't run away from a hardened bunch of people. Continue to minister. Just continue to serve God. He is worthy to be known and made known just for who he is. Well, there it is. How to be better looking. 
by looking up, by looking in, and by looking outward. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, may we be people who not only hear the word, but heed the word. May we be not hearers only, but also doers of the work. Lord, if there's anyone here today with the slightest doubt about their eternal destiny, I pray today that we have seen the Lord high and lifted up and that the great work of the Holy Spirit would be consummated in lives like that. Because I read in scripture that if he is lifted up, he will draw all men to himself. Oh Lord, I pray that people would flee to Jesus Christ today in faith and in trust, believing and then rejoicing at sins forgiven and an unending hope of eternal life in your presence so that we can be with you, the one who is high. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I think someone needs to come and wrap it up. Or I'm going to start preaching again. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor Larkin. We appreciate your ministry to us. All right, hymn number... 357, nearer to my God, nearer my God to thee. Thank you.
Dismissed. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you, Pastor Gabort, for helping us with our music and time. I apologize ahead of time. I need to keep my distance because of health. Okay. I, I'm really. I want to give each of you a hug.